Así que me gusta. Hey, how's everyone doing? Glad you guys are here. Welcome to our next episode of Into the Mix. I'm Anthony, part of Oya. We got Adam with us and we got Alex. You guys want to introduce yourselves real quick? Hi, everybody. I'm Adam Sherwood McGrew. I am Director of Young Adult Ministry at St. Ignatius Loyola Parish in Sacramento. And I am Alex Barraza. I am the Youth and Young Adult Ministry Regional Cornelio, what is my title? I keep forgetting what my title is. But yeah, I work with um, Anthony. So, yeah, Alex yeah. and I work together as regional coordinators for the Diocese of Sacramento. Um, and uh, what are we up to tonight, you guys? What's going on? We have uh, Father Bart Landry on the show tonight, Director of Black Catholic Ministry for the Diocese of Sacramento, talking about Kwanzaa and kind of Advent, how the two relate. And uh, he's sharing a signature drink. I'm really excited to see that. Yeah, and for people who don't know, the signature drink will be a mint julep, and he has his own recipe. But if you guys find other recipes online, may it be virgin or whatnot, stick with it. Do your thing. Uh, but with that, why did we choose Father Bart? And if I'm correct, it was Alex who, who um, suggested him. So, Alex, you want to explain that a little bit? Well, Father Bart is awesome, right? I mean, we love Father Bart. Yet, we're going to be talking tonight about Kwanzaa. And the meaning of Kwanzaa. Kwanzaa is one of the um, celebrations in the African American um, mm -hmm. cultural family. So I'm very excited. We're going to learn a lot. Um, Father Bart is um, um, an expert in you know, everything cultural. So if you have questions, put them in the chat and um, we'll make sure Father Bart answers questions, especially about this um, special celebration. We're really, really glad. You can join us. We have 11. We have some. No, we have more than have a whole bunch of people in our YouTube. Um, um, what is it? Live channel chat channel chat. I don't know. I don't you know. Ah, so I'm yeah, old. if you're here with us, um, say, hey, just say who you are, where you're from, and that way we could uh, see who's around, what parishes are representing, or what areas are representing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please do that. Yeah, but but with that, Adam, what's one thing you're excited about to hear about tonight? I think I'm really excited to learn a little more about Kwanzaa. Um, it's a holiday that I don't know too much about. And in talking with Father Bart a little bit and getting some background, it was really cool to hear some of the Christian principles that are woven into the holiday and maybe how it relates to Christian tradition um, and just learn more. I'm really interested in the educational aspect of tonight's show. Awesome. Awesome. Alex, any thoughts on that too? Yeah, I want to know the significance, the cultural meaning of uh, the symbols. Um, uh, then every cultural uh, celebration has um, uh, meaning, and uh, it has a cultural meaning. Um, uh, so I, I'm very excited to 
learn about that. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I don't know anything about Kwanzaa, so I'm excited just to get some basic stuff. That way I expand my understandings of just different cultures and realities. So that'll be fun. That'll be cool to do. But but with that, oh, oh, we got people saying where they're from. We got Jessica from Divine Mercy. We have Clara and Josue, St. Lawrence. And then um, we have Anthony. Awesome. Welcome, you guys. I'm glad you guys are here. Um, with that, we should get started soon. And so any other announcements or introductions before we invite Father Bart on? I think we're going to have announcements at the end. We have a whole bunch of announcements. So don't go away because then we have a mixer afterwards. Um, uh, we're going to have um, 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 a celebration um, uh, after the, the live stream. So stick around. We're going to put them um, in the chat. We're going to put where um, that's going to take place. Um, so um, this is going to be this is not over this is gonna go on for a while so get ready to celebrate yeah, it's gonna be good and hey welcome sarah good to see you it's been a while how you been sarah and then we got alan as well that's awesome man we got saint vincent's saint lawrence representing this is awesome good i'm glad you guys are here awesome cool so um i guess we should hand it off to adam and then invite father bart on eh? mm -hmm. awesome. sounds good so we're gonna be signing off and we're gonna be in the background and uh, we'll um, leave it to um, Adam. So see you guys in a bit. Awesome. Well, welcome, everyone. For those of us joining us a little later, my name is Adam Sherwood McGrew. I'm the director of young adult ministry at St. Ignatius Parish in Sacramento. Uh, but more importantly, our guest of honor tonight is Father Bart Landry. He is director of Black Catholic Ministry for the Diocese of Sacramento. And he's joining us to talk a little bit more about Kwanzaa. But first, we're going to be able to see, uh, and if you want to, make along uh, a signature drink, which is going to be a mint julep. And that recipe is scrolling across the bottom of your screen right now. So if you have the ingredients, go ahead and get those out and uh, get them prepared. And we'll go ahead and bring Father Bart Landry onto the screen and open up with a prayer. Hi, Father Good. Bart. Hello. Good evening, and thank you for having me. I must say I was in the background watching all of the introductions, and I said, boy, I really want to meet that Father Bart one day. I, I, I think he'll be good to know. Well, I'm excited to meet him tonight. I mean, star of the show. We're looking forward to getting to know you and getting to know your ministry for sure. Um, we are going to first open with a prayer. Uh, would you be able to lead us in one as we kick things off? Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh God, grant us the serenity to accept the things that we cannot change, courage to change the things that we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, Accepting the hardships of life as a challenge to growth in order that we may, as Christ, accomplish many good works in our lives. Give us the grace always to open ourselves to the power and the grace of the Holy Spirit that we may know, love, and serve you by serving the needs of our brothers and sisters. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father Bart, for opening yep. hearts in prayer. Let's, uh, let's learn a little bit more about that signature drink that you brought along with you, that mint julep. What made you choose that tonight as the signature drink? Well, uh, I believe uh, with a bias that God has a special love for the South. 
being from the South myself, you can understand that bias. But uh, the, the mint julep is a, is a drink of relaxation and it is not, it was never intended to be a drink that was say served at a party. It was more served as hospitality at the home. Uh, picture, if you will, nice big oak trees and having a, a nice mint julep under the breeze of the trees as you had just gentle socialization, but not a, a, in the sense of a party. So I chose uh, this drink because I believe that that's uh, to spiritualize it a little bit. Uh, I believe that that's how uh, my relationship with God grows. Uh, slowly and at a slow pace. And the good news of God's love is that that breeze with that sweet hint of mint uh, that always encourages me uh, to be a little bit better. Uh, so the mint julep for me is is one of a uh, a personal favorite, but it's, you know, when, when you stop and think about it, as we should all things, when we spiritualize, uh, it just becomes uh, a little bit more enjoyable. And it's a so bourbon it's a, drink, correct? That's right. It is a, actually, uh, you know, uh, the, mint julep, the mint julep, it all depends on the region uh, that you are, you are in, um, uh, in fact, uh, in, in Kentucky, Kentucky, of course, uh, uses bourbon, uh, but Maryland, say in Maryland, Maryland likes, uh, uh, those in who make it in Maryland, uh, like to use rye. Whereas in Georgia, uh, they like to use, uh, versions of peach alcohol. So it all depends on, on where you are uh, on the spectrum and your taste. So as we were saying before, Adam, uh, I think that you can perhaps make any type of a julep uh, that you want, uh, because if you can think it, then you can make it. Definitely. Um, so let's, I have my ingredients here in front of me. What should we start with? Okay. So we start with uh, one fourth cup of water. So I, I put all of my ingredients here and my one fourth cup of water. Boom, how beautiful. And then of course, you want the uh, the sugar to to dissolve into the the water. So the next would be the one teaspoon of white sugar. Give that a nice stir until that sugar is uh, sweetened in the water. So you know, uh, look at it as uh, we the water. And God is that sugar that comes in and is dissolved into our lives. It sweetens us, gives us a nice, uh, sweet disposition. What do you think about that? That is a good analogy there. Now, Lady Ophelia Stormslayer is saying she makes her mint juleps with gin. What do you think about that? Oh, I think uh, uh, gin is um, a drink of champions. It's certainly a... Uh, uh, a drink that I would not, uh, I would not buy in because I'm not. Uh, my constitution is not that strong. But hey, I say, uh, if you can handle it, then do it. Awesome. What do we have next going into it? All right, our mint leaves. Now here, uh, I have a little pack of um, fresh mint leaves from the store, and it really doesn't. Um, as long as it's fresh, it really doesn't matter. Uh, what brand at all. But if you if you have the opportunity while you're picking it out in the store, uh, just kind of sniff them just to make sure that they're nice and fresh because you want the freshest so that when you, as we will do right now, take a few of the leaves and you begin to tear them, you really want that aroma. You really want that aroma to come out and, oh, 
See, I didn't tear my leaves. That was my first mistake. I just put them in the water. Well, to That's right. You should uh, the the uh, tear them. You want to twist them and tear them because then that draws the real the the nice mint flavor out. You can leave them whole when you garnish it at the top, but for the bottom, you just want to take about three or four leaves, tear them, and put them right into the water. Now, do you muddle these, or do you just put them in the water, like mash them up? Just put them in the water, take your spoon, and just give one nice stir. That's the stir of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes into our lives at times and really gives us just a little stir, just enough to rattle our cages, to, to keep us from getting too complacent uh, and accepting anything that comes our way. But with that, with the rattling of our cages by the gift of the Holy Spirit, uh, then we remain that, that sweetness that God has instilled in us. The next thing we have is our bourbon. I have a nice little jigger and uh, usually about uh, one and a half ounces to two ounces of uh, bourbon that you want to put in the uh, to add to your uh, mint water and sugar uh, I would say that um, if you uh, you can always as cooks say season it to taste so if you like it a little bit stronger uh, then you can add a little bit more if you don't like it as strong you can add a little less so we're going to go with the uh, right in the middle at about two ounces. Two ounces of bullet bourbon, Kentucky bourbon. Uh, again, the bourbon of choice or the alcohol of choice uh, is completely up to you, but this is the one that I prefer. I like the, the sweetness of that uh, drink. So you can tell I'm more disposed to the sweetness of the drinks. Uh, as I am with life. I like the sweet moments in life, uh, which allows me to really savor the gifts of God in my life. Now, are you, uh, when it comes to bourbon, some people are quite uh, opinionated or they have a bourbon that they really stick to. Do you have one, is Bullet your favorite or um, are you partial to another brand? Do you just go with whatever you see first when you go in the grocery store? What's your recommended? Recommended. Uh, bullet is one of my bullet is my favorite for mint julep. Um, I like different bourbons. It, it depends upon what I'm drinking and what the occasion is. For me, everything has an occasion and a place. Uh, even in what I choose to eat and drink. Uh, so, uh, for since we are doing the mint julep tonight, I went with the with the bullet. Awesome. So we have the uh, two ounces of uh, bullet Kentucky bourbon, and we add that to our uh, mint, our sugar, and our water. Take that once more, give that just a once over. And then finally, again, uh, just your ice. Some ice. Now, something that I'd like to point out to you, uh, just for uh, tonight's demonstration, uh, I'm using a tumbler. But usually, generally, a mint julep should be made ahead of time and should be poured into uh, a julep glass, uh, not really a tumbler, but I didn't want to use too much of the uh, of the bourbon for tonight because unfortunately I can make the drink tonight, but I cannot have it uh, tonight. So I didn't want to make a whole lot and then have to dispose of it because then you would hear me crying from where you are. <laughs> Can't let a good drink go to waste. That's right. So now we're going to add our ice cubes. I I usually add anywhere from 
uh, three to four ice cubes. Again, ice cubes are, uh, that's completely up to uh, your taste. Remembering that you already added, you already started with uh, one fourth cup of water. Uh, and so the ice over time is going to melt. So you don't want to water down your drink too much, uh, but you know you, you want it enough to uh, to keep it chilled uh, because a hot ju uh, mint julep is really not a good mint julep. Well, when I, you're drinking a mint julep on a warm southern day when it's humid and 90 degrees, I'm sure you want it ice cold. Absolutely. There you go. And finally, for the uh, for the garnishing, this is where you can take your mint leaf, mint leaf as a whole, and simply place it in the glass. And also, if you want to be a little bit creative, kind of rip a little bit, put it on the edge. Oh, that's fancy! And there, there's your mint julep. Father Bart Landry's mint julep. How do you like that? You know, I'm gonna take a sip here. I gotta do my leaf tear. We gotta be gotta be fancy. There we go. First sip. Let's see. Mm, fresh. Extremely fresh. Fresh. Refreshing. This is what happens when we truly encounter Christ in our lives. We are refreshed and freshened for yet another day. Absolutely. So you mentioned that this is a drink that uh, hails from a region of the country that's near and dear to your heart, which is the South. Now, when we were speaking briefly before coming on the live stream, you mentioned you grew up in Louisiana. Is that correct? That's correct. Awesome. A, little, a little town called Church Point, Louisiana. Now, did you, how big was your family? I'm the youngest of 13. Wow. What's yes. the age range? So um, you were, when you were born, how old was your oldest sibling? Uh, let's see. We are, we are 22 years apart. Okay. So big age range then. Yes. Yes. Now, the first set was almost out of the house. And by the time I came along. Okay. And did you grow up Catholic? Yes. Yes. Uh, my, uh, my mother's side of the family is, um, is Catholic and my father's side of the family is, uh, is non-Catholic. And, uh, we were in a sense given a, uh, although we were all baptized, uh, Catholic, we were given the the option to choose uh, uh, as we as we grew uh, choose what what was going to feed us, but we had to make it. It was it was not an option in our house to choose nothing. Uh, you had to choose one or the other, and it was. Uh, I jokingly say that uh, we all chose. Uh, my brothers and sisters and I. Uh, chose to be Catholic because with my mother, uh, we knew that uh, we got dressed on Sunday morning uh, and went to church, usually the 10 o'clock mass. And by uh, five minutes of 11, we were home. We were out of church, home, and sometimes uh, even out of our church clothes. Uh, whereas with my father, we jokingly said we left home on Wednesday night and did not get home until Sunday afternoon uh, because the services were so long. So naturally, we were inclined. But as we all grew and, and matured, uh, we all just we, we uh, all just grew in the faith, uh, not without struggle, but uh, all remained Catholic. Now, choosing to be Catholic is. Uh definitely the next step after being told to be Catholic. I think many people can sometimes grow up as cradle Catholics, which it sounds like you were born into a Catholic family, but you were given the freedom to choose. Um, in a world today when there's so many other things to choose over being Catholic, what's your advice for those that are faced with that choice to be Catholic or to either, uh, or to kind of abandon the faith or leave the faith behind? 
uh, you know, I, I uh, people who go on a uh, a faith journey, searching uh, for meaning in their lives, that relationship that's going to sustain them. Uh, I often tell people that that's not uh, that's not a bad thing. Uh, because in that journey, uh, you personalize the Catholic faith. There is nothing worse to me than a person with a very generic Catholic faith. Uh, you have no thoughts of your own. You do not know how to integrate the teachings of the church within your life, uh, but you sort of become just a parrot that spits back uh, what's written in the catechism. Well, anybody can do that who who can read it, but what does it mean? How is it applicable to your life? So, you know, I can really appreciate the seeker and those who seek and find and appreciate the Catholic faith in a way that it becomes a very personal faith. Absolutely. So you grew up Catholic. How did you, you chose Catholicism on your own. How did you begin to kind of discern the priesthood? What were those indicators? What were those people? What were those feelings that really kind of started to draw you in that direction? And at what age did you start to have those feelings or have the ideas of maybe the priesthood is for me? Wow. Uh, you know, if um, I began probably about 12 11, 12 years old, uh, beginning to think, really beginning to engage my faith a little bit more, under, under, understanding more the rhythm of the mass and what was really taking place. And I just remember over and over seeing uh, at that time, uh, when I was around, you know, 10, 11, 12, um, in going to church and really, really paying attention, uh, the liturgy was not well developed in my home parish. So what we experienced was at mass, we saw a priest come from the sacristy, uh, celebrated mass and went into the back into the sacristy after mass. And that was the end of it. But there was something about it that impressed me that really caught my attention. Uh, and I, I just really began to pursue on my own in, in, in a very, uh, what I would call clumsy way, because I had, I didn't have the language or the understanding, but then there was one priest in particular, Father Joseph Brown, uh, who is now deceased, Joseph Fight Father, who are priests who staff my home parish, who really impressed me, and in a sense, without me realizing it, took me under his wing. Uh, but at that time, I never thought that I would be a priest. And uh, uh, to this day, you know, just my personality and my my extended family who jokes with me when I say, you know, I, I never thought really that I would be a priest. And uh, some of them jokingly say, well, we're still questioning whether you're a priest or not. <laughs> so that's still, that's still up for debate. But uh, I entered the seminary in high school. So I, I went to public school uh, until the age of 13 years old, which was middle school. Uh, and then at the, um, at the ninth grade, uh, I entered high school seminary, Divine Word High School Seminary in East Troy, Wisconsin. Uh, and I was there for four years. It was not a uh, an easy transition for my mother. Being the youngest, my mother was not uh, really keen on me leaving the seminary. I had never been away from home, so she was uh, really uh, concerned that I would I would have uh, I would be homesick and that I would be wanting to return home. And never having been away from home, not even for an overnight anywhere, because everyone I knew lived right in the neighborhood. So we didn't need to sleep over at anyone's house. We simply walked out the door and there we were. Uh, so I'd never been away from home. And it was a, uh, it was a shock, uh, but uh, one day at a time, one month at a time, one year at a time, I stayed. And I returned back again after the breaks and went back again. Uh, 
And before I knew it, it was graduating from uh, Divine Word High School Seminary uh, in East Troy, Wisconsin. My, uh, my family, mind you, had never traveled uh, really outside of the state of Louisiana. We could not afford those big vacations, so we, we made do within the state. This was the first time that my family rented a, uh, it took about four 17 passenger vans and they drove day and night from Church Point, Louisiana to East Troy, Wisconsin for my graduation. And they were all there for my for my uh, graduation. Um, uh, went home for the summer and then it was on to college seminary. And so bumbling and fumbling through that, trying to decide uh, did I want diocesan way of life? Did I want religious uh, to be in a religious community? Uh, I was I was unsure about that, so I entered Saint Minerid uh, Seminary in Saint Minerid, Indiana, and there they have a program uh, for unaffiliated seminarians. So you're a seminarian, but you're not yet affiliated with a diocese or a religious community. But it is after your your sophomore year in uh, in undergraduate seminary okay. that you need to declare, um, that you need to declare uh, where, you would, where you would serve. So uh, I went back to the Diocese of Lafayette, Louisiana, which is my home diocese, uh, and I was there. And so the diocese says, hey, we're gonna bring you closer. Uh, so I went to seminary and finished up my last two years in uh, Covington, Louisiana, uh, at Saint uh, Saint Ben's or Saint Benedict Seminary in Saint Benedict, Louisiana. Uh, and then from there, I realized after some discernment and spiritual direction that um, diocesan life was not for me. Um, and so I explored religious communities, and strangely enough. But a happy strange, I entered St. Bernard Abbey in Coleman, Alabama as a monk. Uh, and I was a monk there for a dozen years. Uh, and then again, through discernment and spiritual direction, uh, looking at the apostolic life, uh, with, uh, especially with the preaching ministry, I looked toward the, uh, to the Paulist community and I entered uh, about, I uh, guess about almost 20 years now, uh, ordained uh, 14 years. And so 14 years and seven, about seven years of formation. Uh, so I've been a Paulus uh, since, uh, yeah. Awesome, fantastic. What a journey that takes you all, has taken you all over the country, different cultures, different places. I'm sure you've seen just so many different approaches to the Catholic faith. So many, yes. The uh, different parts of the uh, the country, you know, especially in Louisiana, especially in the diocese of Lafayette, Louisiana. It's it's a very uh, it's a very innocent, a very devotional faith, and uh, uh, people. Uh, I use my my mother for an example. Uh, she's much more devotional than she is theological, uh, but yet I, I uh, refer to her uh, affectionately as uh, my greatest theologian because it is through her her devotional life and her prayers uh, that her ability to articulate uh, an experience of God uh, really resonates with me and uh, and enriches uh, my life. Now, how does does Kwanzaa fit into Christianity, and is it where where does Kwanzaa originate, and um, are there principles that the two traditions share? What tell us a little bit more about about that? Absolutely, uh, Kwanzaa. It's uh, Kwanzaa was is uh, was never meant to be a religious holiday. Kwanzaa is not a religious holiday. In fact, it is a cultural uh, holiday. Uh, that, that we as Blacks and African Americans celebrate. It is wonderful that it, it finds its home during the season of uh, Advent 
in preparation for Christmas because it is uh, it is a day, it is a a time, a period, a week um, uh, of preparation of that great encounter that we all receive. So much like the season of Advent in which we wait with expectation and hope. Both Kwanzaa uh, and Advent, uh, our, our Christian, our Catholic Christian celebration is not focused on uh, gift giving and uh, uh, contrary to popular opinion and in normal circumstances, all these parties that happen during uh, the Advent season. Uh, Advent like Kwanzaa should be a time of really focusing inwardly and seeing uh, the gift that, that's most important is the gift of ourselves and how we interact uh, with others in our lives. And so uh, Kwanzaa, Kwanzaa uh, really tries to instill uh, principles, if you will. It, it has seven principles, and these seven principles uh, really try to help a person focus, yes, look inwardly, but focus not only on themselves and others. In other words, don't become so self-absorbed that you miss your opportunity uh, and your privilege uh, to be of a, a collective body. So in, in the... Uh, in the faith, we call that, you know, that, that, that spirit of accompanying. Uh, and that's, that's what uh, Kwanzaa is really about. It is uh, about accompanying, accompanying uh, our brothers and sisters along the way. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's focused on to like Advent, again, on uh, maintaining a, a um, an anticipation, an anticipation to encountering something great. But the only way that you're going to truly feel the impact, uh, the rich impact of that encounter is if you're properly disposed. So uh, Kwanzaa, like Advent, calms you. It centers you. It gives you the opportunity to focus and uh, be patient in anticipation in what is to come, in the possibility. Absolutely. So would you say um, that there are ways, and this is a question from Lady Ophelia Storm, Storm Slayer on YouTube, how can one, are there ways to integrate aspects and traditions and rituals of Kwanzaa into, the, into Catholic faith traditions, especially during the Christmas season? Uh, certainly, uh, in, if it's, um, it really depends on the parish that you belong to. I've celebrated, um, uh, Kwanzaa, uh, within the Catholic church, uh, during the season of Advent, uh, again, depending upon, uh, the priest and the culture of the community, uh, while we recognize that it is not a, uh, a religious, uh, uh, festival, it is celebrated through the lighting of candles and through the reading of principles, uh, because these principles, as I said, uh, while it is not overly uh, religious, it is certainly spiritual. Uh, and certainly in the home. In the home, you can celebrate by um, perhaps reading, focusing on each one of the, uh, the principles uh, of Kwanzaa, and really just as you would meditate on, uh, say, your favorite scripture passage for, for the day, meditate on one of the principles of Kwanzaa, or all of the principles of Kwanzaa on a different day, uh, and see how uh, that enriches your anticipation uh, of the encounter of Christ at Christmas. One of the uh kind of the symbols of Kwanzaa is, are the candles and uh, the candle holder, which is a canara, is it a canara, correct? That's right. What do the candles represent and what do the colors of the candles represent? Are they a, a symbolic of anything in particular? The, the uh, candles and the uh, colors are represent one, like, much like the flag, 
uh, the people, the color, uh, and the blood that was shed, sort of. So you can see again, the martyrdom, the blood, how important that is uh, for the significance of reminding us of who we are and the blood that we shed. Yeah. Absolutely. Generally black and red candles. Black and red, fantastic. So did you grow up celebrating Kwanzaa in your family? No. I that that's uh, that's fascinating a fascinating question but uh, we did not uh, in the home celebrate uh, Kwanzaa. In fact, um, I was I guess I was a freshman in college uh, before I actually celebrated Kwanzaa. I always uh, knew what Kwanzaa was uh, because at the church. Uh, we had several groups, and each one of these groups had taken one of the principles. There was the Umoja group, that was the youth group. There was the Imani group, that was, that was the hospitality group. So you could see how Kwanzaa certainly had an influence in the parish, uh, but it was never celebrated in the parish, and it was never celebrated in the home. Okay. Definitely. So would you say um, that when you were first, when you first encountered Kwanzaa in practice, um, were those friends of yours that showed you uh, the kind of the traditions of it? Was it uh, your fellow seminary? It was in college, you said, correct, while you're still yeah. in the seminary? Yes. Was it fellow seminarians? Um, you know, I had already read a whole lot about Kwanzaa and had really uh, reflected on the principles, and as I said, we while we, while it was never celebrated, uh, it was taught. It was taught by the the sisters of the Blessed Sacrament, uh, who were the the sisters in my home parish. Uh, but it was just not. Uh, it was part of the CCD program, but as a program, not really as a celebration. Uh, and then as I continued to grow up and read about it. So I already had a background in, uh, at uh, St. Meinrad when uh, we were celebrating uh, Kwanzaa. Uh, it was simply putting, um, putting life to what I had already learned and, and read about. So it, it wasn't really, it was new and it wasn't new. Definitely. One, another question from one of our viewers. In 2020, with the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, what can Catholic brothers and sisters of color do to open the awareness of the principles of Kwanzaa and the church without virtue signaling? Um, I think that's, that's a great question. And the, what we can do is uh, begin what I call a better black evangelization. Uh, meaning expressing our faith uh, in the way that our faith was meant uh, to be expressed, which has been conditioned by uh, our culture. What do I mean by that? Uh, meaning, let us sit and listen in patience. Uh, let us take uh, note uh, that what we say and what we do reflects what we believe. And just as in the African-American family, uh, you are constantly reminded when you step out of the doors of your house, whatever action you do beyond the doors of your house, you're representing that family that is still within the house. And so you should do nothing that you think would bring shame or disgrace among your family. So it's family first. So begin to take uh, the principles of um, of uh, Kwanzaa and incorporating that in a way that's very earthy, that's very practical. Uh, don't over spiritualize, uh, but speak to the truth of the experience. Uh, say what you believe and believe what you say. Absolutely, absolutely. In your position of director of Black Catholic Ministry in Sacramento, what are some of your 
objectives, culturally speaking, socially speaking, in terms of looking at the church and the state of the church today um, in our diocese, in our nation, and in our world, what are some of the goals and priorities and objectives that, in your view, we need to be working towards? Uh, I think we are, we are at a time where uh, I would say one of the blessings uh, of this this uh, horrendous pandemic, yes, a, a blessing that has come out of it, it has awakened us uh, to the shortcomings of of, what, of things that we take uh, for granted or those things that we rather not talk about. During this pandemic, because we've been locked down, we've been forced to refocus our energies and our attentions. Uh, so those things that we'd rather not discuss or look at or speak about, uh, in a way, we have been uh, we have been challenged to do that. And one of the one of the painful uh, issues of our church is that of racism. And how are we going to um, strive as Catholic Christians to address racism in our world when we cannot uh, do that within the confines of our own um, Catholic community? So one of the, the goals is uh, bringing a greater awareness and more significant discussions on looking at ways in which we can uh, eradicate uh, this evil from, uh, from our, our Catholic uh, Christian community. Uh, because I believe to say, to allow it to fester here within our church while sort of being a champion in our community makes us a bit of a, of a hypocrite. I think we must clean our own houses first and address the issues before we can clean the house of the larger community around us. Uh, so uh, really looking at ways in which we as a church uh, can address uh, and hopefully eradicate uh, the evil of racism that just divides and uh, really rips apart the, the human family. Um, and, and I think one of the ways in which we begin to do that is by conversation. Having these tough dialogues, uh, as I'm uh, fond of saying, we, we have to name it. We're naming this evil now. This evil is racism. And we must claim it. Uh, we must claim that, yes, we are uh, a racist institution. Uh, but uh, because we admit that, that is not an excuse for us to simply walk away. Because if we walk away, uh, then it only remains. We must stay and have the uncomfortable and the challenging uh, conversations uh, about what can we do together uh, to eradicate this from our, and then uh, that's the taming of it. You know, that's that's really getting a hold on it and acknowledging and holding ourselves accountable. Uh, a big part of uh, why racism continues to rear its ugly head is that uh, we never like to hold ourselves, even as Catholic Christians, accountable. We all are accountable and we must acknowledge that because we never are we can never do anything unless we first own it when i own it it becomes real it becomes significant and then i have the capacity to really uh significantly address it so owning it's the first step it sounds like what would be some next concrete actions i mean these young adults as kind of the next generation of leaders within the church, what are some concrete actions that some of our viewers can take within their parishes to address that racism after they've owned it? After, after you've owned it, uh, look at ways in which the, uh, the faith of the Black and African American community can be nurtured. Come to recognize uh, that, uh, that it's not a one-size-fits-all that the road and the path to God, to worshiping God and developing a relationship and sharing in that spirituality is not 
and does not have to be a one size fits all. Meaning in our parish, how can we build communities uh, that celebrate diversity? And it's not, uh, and it should never be just uh, uh, simply us against them. Once we set that premise up, we have lost what it really means to come together in solidarity. But it is looking for creative ways by saying, for example, what about Black History Month? Uh, let us celebrate Black History Month. Let us get with, um, and if we don't have any Blacks or African Americans in our parish, uh, let us look at asking someone, a priest, a brother, a sister, to come in and educate us about uh, Black History Month, giving a talk in the parish, arranging all of these things. They're all practical ways in which we can uh, celebrate. How, how are we going to celebrate Our Lady of Guadalupe? How are we going to celebrate um, uh, Misa de Gallo? How are we going to celebrate all of these different cultural feasts in our parish so that we may truly recognize uh, God's diversity among us through celebration. I think those are the practical ways. Begin to ask, uh, how do we, let's look around and see who is actually in my parish and who can I reach out to to begin to ask those questions. Father Bart, thank you for an educational talk tonight. Thank you for giving us some challenges as young adults tonight in our parish communities. I think going forth, you've given us some food for thought, but also some seeds for action in our own lives and in our own communities. Um, so I appreciate you being here and spending the time with us. We're going to bring back uh, Alex and Anthony now into the, the screen here and see if we have any questions, leftover questions, uh, last minute ones that we can ask Father Bart before uh, we move to announcements and into our mixer. Anthony? Hey, thanks for having me back. Um, I know one of the questions that did pop up, uh, just for me, my friends and everything, um, the whole Paulist community, what are some charisms of that of that order? Uh, the Paulist Fathers, we are a community uh, and our, our charism are evangelization, uh, reconciliation, and ecumenism and interreligious dialogue, evangelization, through the preaching of the word and reaching out. Uh, so that's my, the ministry uh, that I'm in now. Uh, I am part-time uh, evangelization, meaning I preach retreats, uh, parish missions, parish days of recollection. I give different talks in parishes. And then part-time, I'm in the Diocese of Sacramento in various capacities, but particularly with the Black Catholic community. Uh, reconciliation, we uh, are a community of reconcilers, not just confessional reconcilers, but in terms of building bridges and looking at uh, positive ways in which we can bring peace, hope, and healing to uh, an often uh, divided and painful situation or situations in people's lives. In terms of reconciliation and uh, evangelization, we as Paulists believe that we meet the individual where they are. So if we uh, were to come in contact with, or someone came to us who, who some might consider uh, broken or weak in faith, well, that's where we meet them. Uh, and then uh, finally is uh, ecumenism and interreligious dialogue. So we believe in dialoguing and uh, communicating with uh, our brothers and sisters uh, of other faiths uh, who really strive to, again, preach the, the good news of God's love through uh, their traditions and really look at ways in which we can uh, collaborate and build up the kingdom of God uh, here on earth. Wow, that's something. That's that's a whole lot, and we thank you for that ministry. Um, another question that came up from Lady Ophelia Stormslayer, that's an awesome name, is what can we pray for you, for for, for you, Father Bart, in your ministry? Uh, 
I would say uh, in the ministry, uh, as, as I find it now, uh, pray for, certainly for um, strength. Uh, we are at a time in the church right now where uh, there are days when I, I just have to wonder, you know, is, uh, are the efforts that I'm trying to put forth, are they in vain since we find ourselves in this, in this COVID hold? and we have to be created. So certainly pray for, for strength that I, real, that I can continue to remain focused on uh, the call and the work of evangelization. Um, and then uh, for peace for me, you know, I, I believe that if I'm not at peace with, uh, 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 with the world in a sense, uh, in my relationship with God, I'm not going to be as effective as God is calling and challenging me to be. So uh, for, for those things, I, I really, really ask for your prayers. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we're about nearing our end, and so we're going to have announcements soon. But before that, um, where can people reach you, Father Bart, if they had questions, concerns, or, or just want to collaborate? What's the best way to be in contact with you or see what you're doing? Absolutely. The, uh, the best way... Uh, you know, if you really want to know and see what I'm doing, I would say uh, talk to Alex. Alex will give you the best review of who I am. Here. No, uh, you can always reach me at my certainly by we can start off a conversation by email, and that's easy. B, first initial Landry at scd.org. Shoot me an email and we'll take it from there. I also have a website for my ministry, divine-encounters.org. And so uh, that's an opportunity for us to, uh, uh, to connect. Uh, so those are, th those are the easier ways to, to connect with me and the ones that are most direct because I'm always uh, on email. Yeah, and if if people didn't know, Father Bart just made himself an Instagram, if I'm correct, yeah. and that's Father Bart Landry. Is that correct? That's right. That's so, right. Father period. Father period. Is that correct? That's yep. a period. F R period. Bart Landry. Uh, yes, that and that was all done through the uh, through the direction of my boss Alex. He helped me set this up because when it comes to, I've, I've uh, really uh, resisted uh, up until now all forms of this uh, social media stuff. I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on Facebook. But now I am on um, on Instagram. Well, there you guys have it. Start following him and then start making him do things on Instagram. It'd be great to see his ministry and everything he does in action. Get so, have He's going to start putting his homilies um, on Instagram live, right, Father Bart? We, we're going to live, um, Insta live you in your homilies. That's probably another prayer in intercession that you would have to put up. <laughs> awesome. Bart, well, thank you very much for yeah, your. Thank you, Father Bart. Or, thank you, Father Bart. Absolutely. Thank you all for having me. God bless you and keep you. May this spirit, may this season of Advent be a time of deep spiritual growth. Thank you, Father Bart. And uh, would you be open to closing us in prayer tonight? Absolutely, absolutely. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Gracious, loving, generous God, you give us the gift of your son, Jesus, to come among us as one of us in order that we may become more like you. Give us the grace of your spirit during this season of Advent that we may grow in abundance of holiness, of patience, of peace, of understanding. Help us to know, see, and believe that you are a God who works wonders. You are a God who brings forth light in darkness. You are a God who brings forth joy 
out of sadness. May this time of renewal, this time of hope, bring us closer to you in order that we, as your disciples, bring the world closer to an understanding of your creative power and love. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Father Bart. Um, don't go away because we have announcements and um, uh, Brother Anthony is going to share in the YouTube channel the link to the um, Zoom uh, mixer that we're going to have afterwards. So don't go away. It's not Catholic until we have announcements and, um, and we have um, just a couple of them. So I want to uh, invite you to pay attention to the uh, screen. So um, we're having an Advent retreat for young adults. Uh, it's called Wait. Next one is on the 16th. It's at 7 p.m. It's free. Stephen Grisano is coming up. It's going to be awesome. So um, make time, 7 p.m. It's on um, Facebook Live. You can ask questions and you can share. It's going to be it's an awesome time for you, for your group. And um, next month, we have a whole bunch of events uh, for uh, to celebrate uh, the month of life, protect every life. We have um, starting January 11th um, with a culture project talk. Um, uh, on um, Tuesday, January 12th, we have um, 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 uh, um, uh, the talk in Spanish. And um, so we have several talks. We have, we're have we going to start a novena, January 14th to the 22nd. You can talk to your young adult groups and you can join the novena. And on the 21st, our Into the Mix for January is going to be on Protect Every Life. And we're going to have an awesome conversation. We're going to have a Respect Life Mass um, on January 22nd. And um, it's going to be at the cathedral celebrated by the bishop. Um, it's going to be um, a live uh, stream. And uh, at 1030, we're going to have an ultrasound and um, a, a testimony. So it starts at 1030 on the uh, channel. The, we're going to, something that we're doing new this year is because we cannot go to San Francisco for the walk. We're inviting everybody to join in the, in the novena. And on Saturday, January 23rd, we are inviting you to do your own walk around your neighborhood. You signed up. There's the, um, the link right there. So you can sign up and um, um, you get a mask. It's a donation for um, um, the um, uh, many ministries that serve um, um, uh, pregnant women and women in crisis. Uh, and last but not least, we have the Rise Up Young Church. And this time around January 16, 2021 at 7 p.m. Can I believe I'm saying 2021? Uh, I cannot wait until 2021 starts. Um, is, we're going to have the great Mark Hart as a special guest. Um, um, go online on, on firenorcal.com and you'll get all the information. All of this is free because um, we love you and we want to be serving you um always so my name is alex barraza and on behalf of the office of youth and young adult ministry uh we want to um thank you for joining us we pray for you we've been praying a novena to our lady guadalupe every day at 10 a.m on our insta handle at scd oya um and we're praying it for you so please remember that you are in our prayers always so god bless you Again, thank you, Father Bard. Thank you, Adam. And thank you, um, Anthony, for sharing your gifts with us. Um, and um, Anthony is going to, um, Anthony, I believe, um, put the um, event in um, the YouTube uh, chat, the Zoom. Me yes, sure. yes. We already, I already put the uh, chat, the Zoom link inside the Zoom room, but in case anybody still needs it, the meeting ID is 
7707. And the code for it is Mix Mix, capital M's. Mix Please do enjoy. We have some great young adult ministers there ready to receive you guys and go into discussion. It will be a fun time, good fellowship, and a great time to really share your faith and, and, and be encouraged by other people's faith. Thank you, Anthony. And Thank remember, you, mix, mix. So see you around. God bless you. Bye.